May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your seeing, O Lord, our strong rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Andrew brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas. That was 2,000 years ago. What does a called disciple look like 2,000 years later? Three quick stories. One is about Job. Among other things, Joe and his wife knew about the care and feeding of Ted Gulick when I was in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. He was an orthopedic, is an orthopedic surgeon, and Joe was talking to his wife one morning over breakfast and said, we have all the money we need. Imagine that statement. We can educate the grandchildren. I want your permission to stop my practice, close the doors. I'm going to offer myself to the other two orthopedic surgeons in town on an hourly basis. And I want to spend more time doing what I most love. I need time for the clinic in the Caribbean. It turns out that at that season of his life, what gave him the most joy was operating on children who suffered from rickets in that part of the world. And that's what he did. Discipleship story 2,000 years later, number two. She is eight years old, and her family is going to take a turn staffing the hypothermia shelter at their Episcopal church. She came up with a list of things to put in the care package her family will give to the night visitors. Chapstick, socks, and a power bar. Story number three of discipleship 2,000 years later. This man has been on the edge of some potentially dangerous and edgy conversations with local residents here in town, particularly agitated by proposed gun legislation at the General Assembly. He listens. He is disturbed. He tries to offer a different perspective. And every Thursday, over there, in the parish hall, he studies scripture. I am both intrigued and haunted by the calling of Andrew and Peter. I mean, it is astounding, isn't it, that the sovereign Lord of the universe, the author and maker of all that is, has the sublime humility to allow his very being, his identity, his passion, and his purpose to be mediated and even defined by such an ambiguous character as Petros, known to his best friends as Rocky. I mean, my goodness. The Lord of the universe is trusting his very identity to a person who proves to be a coward, a liar, and apparently who can be so petulant in Christian community that St. Paul said, I had to oppose Peter to his face. What sublime humility in the God of the universe 
that would trust his very identity to a, such a one as Simon or Ted or substitute your own name? Whether in the first century, the 20th century, or the 21st century, disciples of Jesus Christ have a way of haunting me. They inspire me, but they always have that tendency to evoke within my soul of souls such vexing questions. For example, here's one of the questions I've lived with for a long time. What would I have done had I been the pastor of a French Protestant church in France during the Vichy government with the Nazi occupying force at the back door and suddenly there is a knock on my door and there is a Jewish woman and her daughter wanting shelter. I know what he did. He took them in even though his precious wife and children were asleep upstairs and he put the whole household at risk of their lives. I know what he did. And it vexes me because I don't know what I would do. All of you that are absolutely sure of what you would do may raise your hand now. <laughs> or you may be vexed with me. Just this past Monday, I was vexed again. Maybe I'm particularly neurotic and easily tortured. I don't know. <laughs> but I finally made it to the African American Museum at the Smithsonian. And I saw the pictures of the dogs and the fire hoses and the group that crossed that bridge in Selma, Alabama. And I saw white faces courageous white faces that marched in solidarity with those people that crossed that bridge that day. And I thought to myself, would I have been in that crowd at that moment, at that moment, Pastor Bonhoeffer, who lived in the mid-20th century in, Ger in Germany, who did not live to see his 40th birthday. As the storm clouds of the Nazi movement were enveloping his native land, he wrote his famous book, The Cost of Discipleship. And it's always been intriguing to me that he didn't write a book called The Cost of Membership. He didn't write a book called The Cost of Membership. I read this book 50 years ago. And on one level, on one level, I've been tortured ever since. What would I have done? Or even more vexing, and probably much more important, what am I doing? What am I doing as a disciple of Jesus Christ in the 21st century? And herein lies a subtle dis dilemma given to me by Pastor Bonhoeffer. But I've also been living with this dilemma for about 30 years. I made a mistake 30 years ago, big mistake. I went on a retreat with an Episcopal priest named John Stone Jenkins. He was the rector, the very successful rector, the revered rector, the prestigious rector of Trinity Church in New Orleans. In a retreat for clergy, he began to confess. And this, his confession went sort of like this. I'm pretty good at what I do. I am pretty good at helping people navigate nature's agenda with the help of the Book of Common Prayer. For example, Mother Nature wants some people to be born, and we've got this lovely liturgy called Holy Baptism. 
and a backup liturgy called Thanksgiving for the birth of a child. And then those children mature and they grow and we've got a liturgy in that prayer book for maturation. It's called confirmation. And so I help them with nature's agenda from the perspective of the prayer book. And then those mature people start thinking about life partners and mating and getting on with nature's agenda. And so we begin, dearly beloved, we have come together here. And then, and then there is some decline in life. And so we've got the service of the visitation of the sick. And I show up at the hospital and we have the oil and the Eucharist and I'm earnest and I listen. And then in the final analysis, I stand and with my sonorous rector voice say, I am resurrection and I am life. And then he said something I will never forget. He said, I am a successful Episcopal priest as long as I do that very well. But I am not sure that doing that very well ever makes a disciple. And let me tell you something. I was about 35 years old, and that confession called out for me, oh my God. Interestingly enough, rather than wallow in his own self-analysis, he went to work and created a program called Disciples of Christ in Community, where he took Episcopalians and had them reflect in weekly small groups on what it meant not to be an Episcopalian or to be a member, but what it meant to be a disciple. And that course took life. And particularly in the southern part of the Episcopal Church, it helped people fall in life with the last five questions in the baptismal covenant after the creed. Last week, you were so fortunate. For before your very eyes in this congregation, an adult woman took on those vows along with some godparents and parents. You saw it last week with your very eyes. You heard her say that she will seek and serve Christ in all persons, that she will strive for justice and peace among every human being. You heard her say that. You watched the water flow over her as she became Christ's body. And where Christ, like Christ did with Peter, where Christ, in Christ's humility, trusted her to be his hands and his heart and his mind and his voice and his presence in this world where we might be shedding blood in the streets of Richmond tomorrow in this world, in this now, in this century, in this moment, in this epoch where God is waiting desperately for our answering yes and waiting desperately to give us a new name and a new identity and a new purpose so that we, as we stand, being his, we are able to say what Jesus said before Pilate. When Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate, Jesus said, for this I was born. My brothers and my sisters in Jesus, I believe you and I from the moment God knew us as he knew Isaiah in the womb, God is preparing us for that moment with every fiber of our being. We get to say, not, I just love being a member of St. James. But God wants us to say, for this I was born. And the world is desperate for us to say, for this I was born, particularly at this time, please understand me. Please do not misunderstand me. I don't know of any Episcopal church or any Christian church for that matter where if the pastor doesn't show up at those transitions on nature's agenda that she or he will be allowed to do anything else. I think good pastoral, pastoral care is the manger in which discipleship is born. 
and it's absolutely essential. If we cannot trust our communities of faith to be there for us when we need them, then we just will not grow. We cannot grow. But this sermon, as I was thinking about how do I end it, that's always a hard part of wrapping it up. It's also an essential part. You've got to wrap it up. I thought, you know, it's really only about what I'm trying to preach about is about two verses of two different hymns that I believe speak passionate truth, but absolutely need both verses of two different hymns. The first verse of the first hymn is this. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's an essential verse. That's why we do Sunday school. That's why we do youth group. That's why we train acolytes. That's why we love each other. That's why we take, that's why we say that we are all within the wide embrace of Jesus Christ. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, and, for the, and the church communicates that to me. But there's another verse that's equally important. It's another verse that we must sing in the 21st century. It's another verse that we must sing as we know the hate and the fear that wants to mix and mingle in Richmond tomorrow. There's another verse, there's another verse that Peter had to sing as he was crucified head down in Rome in solidarity with the church, with the disciples. And the verse is this, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. And now, to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, as is most justly due, we ascribe all might, majesty, dominion, and power, now and forevermore. Amen.